Well, um, thank you all for coming. I think I, at this point I actually can say that I do know almost everybody in this room, so I appreciate your sticking it out with us. Um, if you don't know me, I'm the Interim Faculty Development Center Coordinator, and can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. All right, so thank you for coming, and I want to say that I'm really incredibly honored to introduce our guest. Um, when I accepted the appointment to serve here in the Faculty Development Center this year, I also asked to keep my title as University Service Learning Coordinator. And while some might have questioned the sagacity of that decision, including me, I'm not going to lie, uh, the reason why I'm so adamant was because I wanted this night to happen. I wanted to invite Julie here and have her come and talk to us. So, Dr. Julie Hatcher is from the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Um, she is the Executive Director of the Center for Service and Learning and the associate, an Associate Professor of Philanthropic Studies in the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Nationally, she is a valuable consultant to many institutions on the topics of designing philanthropic studies cu curriculum and integrating service into academic study. Her expertise has contributed to several big national product, projects, including um, she serves on the Carnegie Classification for Community Engagement, which recognizes colleges and universities who um, have an institutional focus on community engagement. And she served on the Association of American Colleges and Universities um, team to develop the Civic Engagement Value Rubric. She's a and frequent collaborator Robert Bringle are among the foremost scholars in academic service learning. Her scholarly work has been cited more than 3,800 times in Google Scholar. She is the person that everybody should be citing if they're going to write anything. Um, more recently, her research interests have actually turned towards how universities can develop civic-minded graduates and how to measure institutional effectiveness at doing so. This spring, she's finished coding an upcoming volume, Research on Service Learning and Student Civic Outcomes, Conceptual Frameworks and Methods, that will be published by Stylus in October. Um, I'm sure that many of you also want to have your students be involved in the community when they graduate, and that's why you're here tonight, and I appreciate that very much. So we're incredibly lucky to have Dr. Hatcher here, and so please join me in welcoming her to Murray State. Thank you so much. I have never been introduced by a librarian, and you can tell that you've done research <laughs> on this introduction. And actually, if I could just quote a few of those facts for my dossier, that would also probably be very helpful. So thank you for uh, that introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here, because you had lots of choices to make today. And um, it might have been a lot easier to head on home and put your feet up or check on your loved ones or your dog or whoever that might be. And you, um, you, you chose to stay here, and so thank you very much. I am grateful that I made it. I saw more of Kentucky than I planned to. <laughs> and as long as it's a small audience, I will just be downright honest. Here's, so here's what happened. In my head, I just thought, I know where Murray State is. Now, don't ask me why I thought that. <laughs> I think I, I know Peter, and I've heard Peter talk about, come, you know, and what, what he and his wife do on the weekend. And I, I drive, you know, I know 65. And then I got two phone calls from work, and I'm barreling down 65. And it suddenly dawns on me, like, wait, no, this, this, this can't be right. Well, this cannot be right that Bowling Green and Murray State are this close to, yeah, that's, that was the feeling. So <laughs> Then I look at my phone, which I, um, I just tend to think I know where I'm going, so my apologies. I'm so grateful to be here because I look at my phone and then realize, no, I'm actually two hours and 38 minutes still away. So... <laughs> I actually left the house early today, and boy, am I ever glad that I did. And I'm really, really appreciative that I'm here, safe and sound, and I'm thankful that you all are as well. So um, our time together, um, I have, I, I have uh, created, of course, um, lots of information. I will try to zip through that in order to um, have time for questions. I know that some of you will probably be at the set workshop tomorrow morning. Um, and so um, that too should give us another opportunity. But um, uh, when Elizabeth and I talked um, and got, and then we I got a little bit more background of of Murray State, and then had um, a good time surfing your your web and finding out a little bit more information. And 
one of the things that um, I realized. One of the things I realized is that, you know, I come from an urban environment, so visually um, we come from very different places as far as the university that I've been um, a part of. Oh, there we go. Um, okay. But when I look at your strategic plan and our strategic plan, it's remarkably similar. Now. It could be that if we looked at all strategic plans in higher education right now, they would be remarkably similar in terms of these particular goals. Um, institutionalizing, high impact practices, community engagement, and, and those types of things. Um, one of the, you know, I, I see that faculty scholarship is, is to be on the increase at Murray State, and, um, and we certainly have a similar kind of um, impact there. Community engagement is the word you, you, we use. You use the word engagement when you're talking about a lot of the outreach work that's going on um, at Murray State. But the thing that caught my attention naturally and in talking with Elizabeth is this goal for um, Murray State to increase service learning by 10 percent, which I sort of think that's ambitious. And then I was reminded, so I've been in this work since 1993, started an Office of Service Learning, 1993. When a chancellor, new chancellor, came in about 2003, Chancellor Bantz, he had what was called a doubling initiative. And he just picked all these things he wanted to double. And that's what <laughs> administrators get to do, you know? And one of the things that he wanted to double was service learning. And so we had, it, the, the, it was to double service learning in seven years, and we'd already had a significant amount. And so this sense of, of what, you know, what did we do on the doubling, I thought, I mentioned to Elizabeth, I said, when I hear your context, it makes me at least want to share three of the key strategies that we found to be beneficial, because it looks to me like you have this goal to increase service learning classes. And so I'll be sharing some of that information. Currently, our campus is not so much at the doubling kind of initiative or the increase in numbers. Where our campus is right now is focusing on the assessment of service learning as a high impact practice. And so we have more emphasis now actually on quality and what can we say about the quality of a service learning class and what are the outcomes that come from that quality. So, um, that might be a difference in terms of where we are uh, with service learning. Um, so this is a long definition of community engagement that's probably uh, used by many universities, including ours, uh, from Carnegie. So community engagement describes collaboration between um, institutions of higher ed and their larger communities for mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources in a context of partnership and reciprocity. So what buzzwords do you hear there? There's a lot of buzzwords in that Carnegie definition. Collaboration. Collaboration. Or partnership. Partnership. Reciprocity. Reciprocity. Mutually beneficial. Yep. So that one of these things about what community engagement, it has these norms that are associated with it. And so this is why, and I, I never, I've, I've never used this. This is going to be fun. Anyway, so the difference between this and this here is we, we do make actually a pretty much of a distinction because a lot of activities can happen in the community and they can be community based. But from the Carnegie approach, and then a lot of people in higher ed around civic engagement would say that there's certain values associated with something that is a community engaged activity. So that um, when we're talking about community engagement, this is a Venn diagram that we've used for a number of years. And it's helped us um, talk about this work. I, I double checked with Elizabeth 
primarily you are all instructors and faculty, I think, is the primary role that's, that's here. And one of the key messages that I would give anyone in, um, who's trying to strengthen this work is it really comes down to faculty work. And when I use the word faculty, I'm talking about instructors, I'm talking about clinical fa adjuncts, I'm talking <clears throat> about faculty who are on a tenure tracks because we know in service learning that all different types of faculty will be teaching the courses. So I'm just clarifying what I'm saying, faculty, it's any instructor. But what we, what we know is that across teaching, research, and service, or if the word scholarship is more appropriate in that blue circle, the idea behind um, community engagement is really faculty work. And so when we started the Office of Service Learning in 1993, we quickly realized that really what this is about is faculty development. And so a lot of what I'll be saying is what's the capacity that you have, and then also what are some internal levers or internal resources that might be able to be tweaked in such a way that are going to support faculty um, development. Um, one of the things, and then so Peter and I did the same PhD program. And so I was able to be in that first cohort, and I forget you, third or fourth, whatever. Um, my interest in uh, my PhD are, is really around the public purpose of higher education. That's what my keen interest is. And all or many organizations, museums, businesses, um, uh, governments itself, Many organizations are asking themselves, with the level of, of uh, public problems that currently exist, with our understanding of resources and capacity building, what is the role of every institution to sort of reach outside its original bounds in order to have a more of a public purpose to it? Um, and you can argue by all means about higher ed that higher education has always had a public mission and it's sort of ebbed and flowed over the history of higher education. But certainly this, this emphasis on the public purpose of higher education is even more prevalent now than, um, uh, certainly now than 30 years ago. And so there's lots of, in, in philanthropy, we know there's lots of motives. We know that somebody who volunteers or somebody who gives charity or someone who's involved with a nonprofit <coughs> board, they have lots of motives that come to bear. I think the same exists in community engagement in higher education. There's lots of different motives. And I'm curious, I'll, I have these, this set, and I would like you to sort of think, um, well, I'll give you this, here's where I'm going. Given your role and viewpoint, which two of these motives seem to be most prevalent um, within Murray State right now. So think of, think of these as we look. So, so there's lots of different public purpose motivations. One might be administrative leadership, and I call this the William Plater effect. That's, I was able to work under his leadership for a number of years and then ask you, created an award for, um, uh, it's called the William Plater Award because it's, how is it that that role of the chief academic officer can make a difference on a campus? And so it's the administrative leadership. So you do it because someone above you is saying, this is a good idea, we need to do it. Another reason you do it, sometimes campuses will just say it's in our DNA, it's who we are. Um, that might come from a faith-based tradition, it might come from an urban metropolitan university tradition. Um, another motive is Stewards of Place. Kellogg Foundation many years ago did a very important place uh, work on Stewards of Place. And so it's this idea that Murray State is a citizen in this local community and therefore we have a responsibility to act as a citizen. So universities as citizens is, is that concept. Or it might be the regional development and outreach. That might be the reason for community engagement. And we're seeing much more emphasis on the role of anchor institutions in community redevelopment work. And so universities, eds and meds, are often seen as the most permanent institution in a geographic area. And so they're the anchor. 
And so it's this idea of an anchor institution has a particular responsibility to address quality of life issues. Another motivation, though, is external recognition. Carnegie classification. Now we've got a seal of approval. Some universities are saying, we want that Carnegie classification. We know, I don't even know if Eastern Kentucky University has the Carnegie. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. But we know so-and-so has that. Or someone might come in and say, like our president actually, uh, the IU system is now saying to all our regional campuses, you must all go after the Carnegie. And you got to go, why? I mean, even I'm in the work and I sort of go, why? But, or the presidential honor roll might be a motivation. Might be a motivation around reaccreditation. This was really important in our story. In 2002, we could do a self-study on anything we wanted to do for the North Central Association. And we did a reaccreditation study on civic engagement. And that was really, I'll say, bene very beneficial to our work. Sometimes that public purpose motivation comes out of a faculty member's sense of who they are. So that some of you are sitting here going, I couldn't teach any other way. It's really who I am. I would call that, my dissertation was on the role of civic-minded professionals and creating a scale to measure that concept. Because I think some faculty see themselves as having a public purpose as an anthropologist, as an educator, as um, uh, teaching accounting in the business school. You see yourself as having um, what uh, William Sullivan calls the public, um, a social trustee of knowledge. You have knowledge, and out of your sense of you as a professional, you feel like you have a responsibility to share that knowledge or cultivate that knowledge in a fundamentally different way if you were thinking of your knowledge more as your own private good rather than a public good. So it might be that. Another new thing, H, knowledge mobilization. There's a big push in higher education now. How is it that we are cultivating knowledge? How is it that we're generating knowledge with, with communities? And that's oftentimes through public scholarship. Another public purpose is student learning. So that people who get into service learning may have more of an inclination to say, I really, really care about student learning. And actually, all the literature on high impact practices has really supported what service learning is from an academic perspective. And then there are some who think, no, J is the most important. So civic learning. Our purpose, our most essential public purpose, is to cultivate civic-minded graduates. Those students, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, who see themselves as social trustees of the knowledge that they've gained in, the, in higher ed to do something in the community with others for the public good. So I'm curious of these. So if I'd like you then to say, so given your role and viewpoint, which two motivations for community engagement seem particularly relevant within the current context at Murray State? Um, oops. Anybody? Yes. I was on our last QEP to select our last quality enhancement plan, and so that was a big that we were looking for for those high impact practices that are going to make a big difference and so we did a lot of research and uh -huh. and so that is where we are okay that's part of us so. i'm curious out of that research is that was that part of the contributor to the increased 10 percent of service learning <clears throat> or not necessarily I mean, it, well, no, it, uh, it might not, not be. It might be like more high-impact practice actually, generally. Actually, no. That's fine. Our, our QEP went into place before our strategic plan 
Oh, okay. Um, in the okay. What? Okay. And so in the QEP, what's it saying about? Well, our, our QEP is um, is about experiential education. Okay. All and right. So we're, Great. We're looking at. Uh, we have a very broad definition of of what experiential education is, and it certainly includes internships and co-ops and our students going out. Service learning is part of our, our definition of uh, you know, the engaged learning. And, uh, we, we <laughs> I, I remember the ERA from, uh, from a different era, but we have the ERA. Experience rich activities, oh, okay. and we're, mm -hmm. we track those through our registrar. So yes, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's our QEP is definitely a now a driver. All for, right. For what you're talking about. Okay. So the QEP. <clears throat> Any other key drivers that you see? That I mean, when you were thinking, which one? Which one do you think are the two? Well, certainly in the areas where we have strongholds like um, nonprofit leadership studies and nursing, I think faculty identity is a big part of it because it's just in their DNA that are kind of served and therefore for that reason. Mm -hmm. I would also say, Jay, I mean, for example, for leadership studies, that's what we aim to achieve, feeling money graduates. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Anybody else? So that's Murray. That's, and then from a personal perspective, which motive is most important to you? Which, which of these motives actually is inspiring to you? And when, I'm, when, I, you know, when I talk with students about inspiring, I'm talking about <laughs> something that causes you to take new action. You know. From a personal perspective, do any of these things matter in a particular way? I believe it's G, G I N. Yes. G I N J. Yeah. G I N J. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, for me, it's because the profession that uh, I kind of come from, social work. Okay. You know, there's so much you have this community engagement, and for me, like you said, you know, teaching is so much where it has to be connected to the community and service that, you know, it just cannot go without it okay. uh, to make it real and, you know, and then of course that high impact practice too for student learning if they know what the real world is like mm -hmm. and connect what they do in the classroom to what really goes on outside and how to be able to realize that. Okay. Um, so that's what I'm in the in the OS program and I had to say all of the above. <laughs> all of the, all of the above. Exactly. Yeah. It's part of what we do. I mean, mm -hmm. I tried to stop one time and almost had a revolt on my head in, in the class. I tried to stop service learning. Oh, okay. They wouldn't let me stop. Yeah, yeah, okay. One of the things I'm aware, like when you say social work, I just want to say social work, um, Rick Battistonian, I didn't include that, I don't think. But he talks about the way, and, and his work really informed our thinking around the concept civic-minded graduate. He said that there's different types of civic, but he argues that civic exists in all disciplines. And so sometimes you're saying social work, or you mentioned nonprofit, you, you can almost easily imagine civic within those, those domains. Um, and yet, what has always been so fascinating for me as a person who has worked with faculty over a number of years is to listen to the imagination of faculty regardless of discipline. When a faculty member, when a chemist, when I, you know, um, uh, we have uh, lots of um, uh, hair in school of art and design, when a design thinker when a journalist, when a, you know, it just doesn't matter what the it is, it's when a faculty member knows their work in such a way and they see that public purpose of it and can come up with a creative way to implement um, the, the service or the community engagement aspect of their teaching. And that's one of the, 
been really probably one of the best rewards about the career that I've had is interacting with faculty regardless of discipline. And because there's these different types of civic, you know, that, that really come to bear. Okay. Um, one of the things that I think is important is that there's this whole set of motives. And in an institution, we're going to have different people that are motivated more by A, by G, by I. They're going to be motivated by all these different things. So they've got different hats on. And it's like one of the things we know about volunteering or charitable giving, if people have mixed motives, it's actually better. If we have intrinsic motives and extrinsic motives, and we have a, a culmination of motives that, that keep us engaged, it might be a set of motives that attract us to something, and another set of motives that come up behind and cause us to stay engaged over time. And this has been a helpful concept for me working in higher ed. Because I bump into, I mean, I have my motives. Mine is uh, the last one, is, is it J or whatever. My, my key, the key thing that drives me is developing civic-minded graduates. Like, that just floats my boat. You know, like, that is just like, what, you know, and this came years ago, reading Bella's Habits of the Heart. And in that particular book, he challenges all institutions to say, what are we doing to reinvigorate um, the civic and the, and the public purposes and the values of people. And so he had, in near the tail end, a paragraph about higher ed. I read this like in about 1995 in a philanthropic studies class. And as I'm reading that, I'm going, I work in higher education. <laughs> this is what I can do. This is the kind of public purpose. So that's what I would be most inspired by and causes me to do what I do. But I work in an environment where there's all these other motives that are coming to bear. And so then all I'm saying is mixed motives are A-OK. -okay. And then when you bump up, you know, they, they increase the likelihood of various different actors across the campus having resources in order to be leveraged um, to support and sustain institutional change over time. And this, I have not ever written about this, but when I do, this is going to be like this little sentence, because I haven't, I haven't thought about it in this way, but just hearing the context that you're in, I realize there's probably lots of different mixed motives going on. And I do think that that's actually what can sustain the work over time is to understand where's, the, where's this person coming from in terms of their motives? What's my dean thinking about this work? What is my colleague thinking about this work? And, um, and having a sense for how is it that somebody else's motives could cause a certain change to happen around resources, I think is really um, helpful. So when I, this talk is primarily focused on the community engaged learning section um, rather than the, the rest of this. And so when we're talking community engaged learning, talking mostly about service learning, I think community engaged research is also oftentimes a strategy that involves undergraduates in this kind of um, civic engagement work. But most of my comments will be focusing on community engaged learning. Um, a number of years ago, we said on our own campus that to focus here was, oh, I have this guy, sorry. <laughs> to focus here was the most important place to focus institutionally because it had to do with faculty and how they work. It had to do with curricular change and it had to do with student learning. What we're seeing is a lot of other pressures that come to bear in this, in this work of community engagement. But we felt like if we could move the needle on that particular um, element within the curriculum, that would move other needles um, on the campus in important ways. And Carnegie actually thinks the same thing. We were able to be a part of that creating of the Carnegie classification and 
it was a huge debate on what is it that really matters to um, a community engaged campus. And the curricular engagement was actually the key element um, conceptually for the very same reason. It was like that would be the best indicator to say how are faculty using their time? How does the institution value learning? What are the partnerships that have been uh, created and sustained? And then now what's the impact on that? And so um, this idea out of the Carnegie Foundation also reinforces the importance of service learning. I wanted to talk a little bit, and this only came because of our conversation, about it sounded as if Murray had been through the Carnegie reclassification process once. Just once. Just once, OK. And then feedback came back for, for whatever reasons. And I just was at the National Campus Compact meeting, and that's organization been in place now for 30 years. And it's, it's just remarkable to think that, the, that this field has lasted that long. And I was able to go to a session that John Saltmarsh gave on the Carnegie classification, and he coordinates that. And he said, the one thing about the, the, the Carnegie classification process is um, it's really a self-assessment. And so his coaching, when he talks with campuses, is that, yes, it, you know, it, it creates a timeline. It, shifts people thinking around internal tracking and assessment. It improves communication across the campus. But ultimately, it's about improvement. And what he is advising is for those um, task forces. So if the Carnegie, if you started a Carnegie task force on this campus to do that, and it's such a crazy long process. I don't know if anybody here was, you were on that. It's crazy long. It's just, it's a challenge. And, it, and they do that almost like a self-selection strategy. Like anybody who's crazy enough to find out all this information must be an engaged campus. <laughs> um, and so what he's advising people is to keep that Carnegie uh, committee together um, and as, as an ongoing committee. And I think that that's a very good thing rather than to say, oh, we got it and now we're done. It's more like, how do you keep that going? So this is a definition of service learning. And I know that you all have a definition of service learning that is what you use. It looks to me like it's from the corporation. Is it the Corporation for National Service? Or might not matter not to sure you, matter. but. Yeah. I, I, I mean, at least there is a definition of service learning. You know, in, in consulting with various campuses, I typically advise that, and not that you have to reinvent a wheel here if, it, if it's not helpful, but I also think it's Murray's, I think it's a, to an advantage to be able to say, here's what Murray State says service learning is. So you, there are different definitions out there. But I do think they're sometimes helpful to have um, a, a definition that faculty have gotten around the table and debated and said, is this really what we're after here? Um, and it's more that thinking around that definition or problematizing, like problematizing this definition and say, does that really fit our context? because there's all sorts of definitions about service learning. Now, our definition uh, has been in place for a while. Um, similar to other definitions, organized service activities, meets identified community needs. I will say this one right here, um, and I didn't highlight it here. So it's they're reflecting in order to gain understanding, of course, content. But early on, I became, again, very intrigued with what does this have to do with the appreci a broader appreciation of the discipline? And actually, um, one of the, um, we had a senior scholar working with us at the time. And this definition has been out since 1996. It was changed a little bit in 2009, but it's 1996. And I remember Sheldon Siegel, who is a social worker, said, don't you really mean broader appreciation of the discipline and its role in society? And I said, yeah, that is exactly what I mean, that we mean, but we don't have 
uh, you know, it became too, too many words. But this, this idea of what is the public purpose of my discipline is a key aspect of service learning. So it's not only this particular course in nonprofit management, but what's the public purpose of this whole disciplinary lens and its role that it plays. But then also this enhanced sense of personal values and civic responsibility. And so, service learning is a distinct kind of experiential learning. And these, these you, you see it, you see diagrams, you see um, illustrations, you, you know, Mary Price, who works in our office, talks about different types of ice cream, you know, like different shades, different textures, whatever. But, if there is not this sense of civic responsibility built in, we would typically argue that isn't service learning. Service learning has this intention, serving to learn in order to learn to serve. That's an old adage around service learning. And so it's very much around uh, challenging students to think about how it is that what they've learned helps them to understand literature better and helps them to understand what might be a public purpose of literature if you're working in a reading group with women in an aftercare facility. You know, so those are the kinds of questions that emerge around the public purpose of a discipline um, that is a little different than experiential learning goes. And so what we've done, and I brought copies, um, and uh, we, I can either give them to you now or before you leave. What we've done is to create a taxonomy. Our campus, we had um, what, what, we, what I think is similar to what Elizabeth has described. You used ERA, is that it? Yep. Okay, ERAs. We have a similar kind of ERA approach, and we call it the RISE initiative. R meaning research, I meaning um, international study abroad, S meaning service learning, E meaning engaged uh, experiential learning that includes all the other things that weren't mentioned, like internships, clinical, st student teaching, all that, all that other stuff. So we had a RISE initiative, and when I came back to the center as the director, I just, I mean, and we've, we've had this conversation all along, but I just started pressing, because it's like, RISE to what end? You know, the, the, it was named the RISE initiative, but what kind of learning do we want to come out of RISE? What's the learning goal? What's the purpose of having all these experiential learning activities? and um, so now, because we have RISE, now our campus is saying every center that's responsible for a RISE component, so our Center for Service and Learning has the S, we needed to come up with a taxonomy, and that taxonomy is the, going to be the basis for understanding what the quality of a service learning course is. And the taxonomy then is working, it's how we'll base our work with faculty, but more importantly from an institutional level, it's going to inform the assessment strategy. And so, you would think we would have done all of this a long time ago, we didn't, okay? We just, we went to the research and started looking at the research and saying, what are the key course attributes of service learning? And so we have, um, uh, and, and from this, reciprocal partnerships, diversity of interactions and dialogue across difference, critical reflection, and critical is a key word there, not just reflection. I think it's critical reflection in terms of critically looking at issues and understanding uh, contradictory perspectives on issues, not just how I feel, I mean, reflection is often how I feel, and critical reflection is a little different. Assessment, the community project, and then civic competency. So again, if, if you don't have an emphasis on this in a service learning class, we would say, well, you're doing lots of these other things, and that's all well and good, and then for it to be a service learning class on our campus now, it's going, you know, this has to be very, very clear. Now, I say all that, let me just also say, I mentioned to Elizabeth, our campus doesn't have, 
we just trust you as a faculty member to say, am I doing service learning? We don't have a committee that approves it. We don't have a mechanism in place to say, ah, Peter, Peter got all five of them, but not six. Mm, no. <laughs> now, part of that is our campus. Our, uh, we're historically a very decentralized campus. Schools have authority way more than um, the central administration. Right now, it's very interesting. This is being driven by an assessment approach. And so now, though, the assessment folks, that's one of our new lovers <laughs> um, who care, the assessment folks are saying, wait, 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 we need to know what do you mean by a quality service learning class? So we went to the research and, and, and said, this is now what we mean by quality service learning classes. And then we're using this from a research perspective. This will be in our new book on civic outcomes because this taxonomy we're now realizing has a whole slew of variables that can help guide research. So when we're talking about um, partner, when we're talking about reflection, we know from research that if it's structured, you're going to have more outcome, more civic outcomes. If you're talking with others across difference, there's different. You know, when you see the taxonomy, you'll see this. And we know that there's all these other things not just course attributes, but all these other variables that if you're doing research or assessment on student learning, you really have to take all of these other variables into account as well. But this has been a very interesting project uh, that we've been a part of, and we mirrored it off of an approach that California State University is taking around high impact practices. So they have a, sl they have a set of taxonomies as well, our campus will be as developing that if that's any direction that you're interested in going in. So in terms of research generally, um, uh, we know there's just this culminating evidence that service learning contributes to academic, it contributes to civic, and it contributes to personal uh, growth and learning. And so when we're saying to what end, you could focus on any one of these what we like to focus on is the intersection of all of these. And you'll see this with the, it's our concept of the civic-minded graduate. The thing that's exciting, I'll say, about being in the field as long as we have, there are, by the way, so many problems with research on service learning because we're not sure what the it is. And we're not sure what the variables are. And so it's really very, very difficult to conduct research on service learning. Easier to do scholarship of teaching, scholarship of my class, here's what I'm seeing in my class, and much harder to do what we do in terms of comparative cross-institutional studies. Um, the good news is we now, it, the field is old enough that there's um, room for meta-analyses to be done. And so meta-analyses, as you well know, are, just, are, are uh, an additional statistical um, inquiry into prior research studies. And so you're trying to figure out from all this body of knowledge in psychology and service learning, or all this body of knowledge in service learning and business, what are the key findings that have, have occurred? And so um, these are three examples of meta-analysis that have been done in the recent years, talking about the value of diversity experiences in service learning, and, our, and I, I think that's such a critical aspect of service learning that we on our campus have yet to sort of programmatically tap into what's actually happening when students are interacting with others in diverse settings. And in terms of how is it that we structure reflection to get at that element of service learning in a way so students better understand how to talk across difference and understand different per perspectives um, through the service learning. So Bowman was interested in that. Um, the meta um, analysis of, um, by Conway and others, um, they identify academic, personal, social, and citizenship outcomes. And then again, they're the ones who identified that structured reflection is much better to, for these outcomes rather than what I'd say informal or soft, just tell me what you think and feel, 
write a journal entry, um, rather than structured being around a particular learning outcome. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. And then also um, an, an additional analysis um, of the cognitive gain, so that now, and we know so much more about learning itself, we know so much more, we care so much more about deep learning and theories of learning and how learning occurs in higher education than when I would have started in 1993. So we know now that um, this, is, this is the definition, this is how Nessie, um, and I don't know if your campus takes the Nessie study, yes. do you? Okay. So, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting analysis. There's lots of problems with Nessie. <laughs> it's student self-report. It's students who volunteer to participate. Um, so there's lots of problems with Nessie data, but it still gives you a, a pulse on things. And so Nessie, there are 12 questions, I think is the measure. It has 12 qu questions that get at these um, different types of learning. And collectively, they're saying, this is what um, deep learning looks like. And so what we did on our campus is to take, um, take the Nessie data from the freshman, the freshman year, and then also the senior year. And look at how was it, how, how did student participation in service learning courses correlate with the, same, with the student self-report measure on deep learning? Again, this is not, we cannot say that one caused the other. We can't. I'm just putting out there that this is an interesting uh, relationship between students who are saying that they have more service learning classes are also saying that they are reporting on deeper learning. Now, Ashley Finley, and her last name is F-I-N-L-E-Y, Finley, um, through AAC and U, has done much more thorough analysis on all the high impact practices. And she finds service learning to be of particularly high value in all of the different measures um, that, that they've looked at um, in that analysis. And, and particularly for underrepresented students, um, service learning has, has gained. So, this is where I come from, Center for Service and Learning. We do lots of different things. And I'm going to lead us into the concept of civic-minded graduates. We're responsible for co-curricular service, and we're responsible for service learning. So when on our org chart, then half of it is on the, on the co-curricular and the staff engagement side of the fence, and half of it is on the faculty side of the fence, is what we call it. And so on this faculty side of the fence, we do lots of different things. Service learning courses, faculty learning communities and programs. We partner with lots of different org, um, campus entities like um, uh, we partner with Office of International Affairs around international service learning. We partner with our Center for, Re our Ser for Research and Learning now to work on community-engaged research. And then we would partner with our, um, on our campus it's called University College, that first year hub where students are walking in the door. And so we partner with them around themed learning community classes and how is it that service gets integrated into themed learning communities. And then we have um, a, a, a research and a program evaluation agenda. But when you see that we have curricular and co-curricular, we started a number of years ago, and this was um, after I read the Bella chapter, and after I came on to this concept of civic-minded professional, and once I started the dissertation work to create a measure on, to, to evaluate that construct of civic-minded professional, what we started to do is to take that, and in our Center for Service and Learning, we had a summer retreat, and we said, why are we doing all that we're doing? To what end are we, what, what's our key goal? What's our key goal across all these different programs, because we're all awfully busy here, <laughs> and what is it that we hope happens? To students. What are we really after? And so we use the phrase educationally meaningful service and we thought that's still a little vague. 
we know that's what we're after, but what does that actually mean? And so then that's where we came up with this construct of civic mindedness. And so civic mindedness is, um, we defined it a person's inclination or disposition to be knowledgeable of and involved in the community and to have a commitment to act on a sense of responsibility as a member of that community. And so a civic-minded graduate became, and those of you in nonprofits uh, organization or theory, you know the importance of a North Star for a nonprofit organization. Nonprofits have this um, inclination to veer where the money is or veer off course and it's really critical, and I remember hearing a lecture on campus about the critical importance of mission for nonprofits, and they use the term North Star. Every, every nonprofit has to hold on to their North Star. And I came back to CSL and I said, you know, that civic-minded graduate, that's our North Star. We have to hold on to that. Otherwise, we could be about doing all sorts of things for students and with students and and we could be about all these different outcomes. And so that's where, so our article on this is called, um, uh, our first article on this was something like civic, I don't know, it has North Star in the title. <laughs> <laughs> so CMG, Civic Minded Graduates, North Star something. In our center, we would say then a Civic Minded Graduate is one who's formally educated and has the capacity and orientation to work with others in a democratic way to improve the community. So this C, in a democratic way, and all this comes from this, the whole um, theory, I'll say, of professionals and the role of civic-minded professionals. A civic-minded professional doesn't take the expert stance. A civic-minded professional works in and with the community in such a way that knowledge is generated. This comes from John Dewey, you know, turn of the century, saying that knowledge is generated in such a way to increase social intelligence for collective problem solving. So this idea of this democratic way is really important. It's really much around the, the whole set of values that I was saying at the beginning around engaged um, community engagement. And so this is our concept of the civic-minded graduate, and this is our illustration of the civic-minded graduate, and you'll see it's pretty similar to that prior one of academic and civic and, and uh, personal. But what we're saying is that a civic-minded graduate is, a pers is that very center spot here, okay? So that I, as a college student, come to the campus, I have lots of different educational experiences. Some may or may not include civic experiences. Now I come to the campus, I may not even care anything about this, I may not come even knowing or caring, and somehow that course gets me to start thinking about the civicness of this discipline or of this major. And so, uh, we uh, use these kinds of examples where it's like, in this case, it would be a student comes and they care a lot about, um, uh, they care a lot about becoming an elementary education teacher. They care a lot about a finance major. major. They care a lot about uh, the organizations that they're a part of. So it start, that starts to change their sense of who they are as a person. They might have a service learning course and they might be doing it, but it has nothing to do with who they see themselves. They see themselves, I've come to Murray State, and I'm going to be a teacher. And I feel really, really good about that. The public domain or the public purpose of that isn't so much in their mind. Another example here would be um, when uh, in the service learning course or in a, con a community engaged course, this is starting to happen, but it has nothing, it doesn't affect who they are. It's not that it changes who they are at all or how they see themselves. It's more like I've been asked to do this, and oh, this is good, but when I leave this place, it doesn't change, it doesn't cause me to think of myself any differently. And so when we're talking about this, 
we think that there's different factors that influence civic mindedness. Structure reflection, we think, is one of those key elements so that you're asking students about the civic or you're asking them about their identity or how they've seen themselves different um, through this Spanish course and what is it that they actually are gaining that has to do with the integration of all these things through structured reflection. We know prior experience matters to the development of civic-minded graduates. <laughs> and we know in philanthropy that so many of these values are actually nurtured already in the family context. The work of Delaz, Keen, Keenan Parks in Common Fire, we, they identify it's a lot about conversations at the kitchen table. Well, then what are we trying to do in higher education? if it has to do only with you know, conversations at the kitchen table growing up. So what we're trying to do, what I, we've often argued in higher education, we're trying not to undermine the values that students bring with them into the university setting. Many come with these values, and we're trying to not undermine the prior experience. We also now know that, um, again, dialogue across difference is a key element that helps students gain a sense of the civic responsibility, and that has lots of influence on what happens in the classroom itself. Um, is there debate that goes on in the classroom? Is there collective decision making that occurs? Is there, are there difference? Is there a way to look at social justice issue from various perspectives? Those would be kinds of dialogue across difference. And then Kristen Norris, excuse me, who's in our um, center as well. She um, has named this term civic mentor. And so when she's done research, saying what's the role of the faculty member or the staff member to actually talk about their civic values. And I think as faculty, often we think we, we you know, there's certain things we can't talk about. What Kristen is arguing is that there are certain civic values, civic virtues, civic action, that if faculty talk about that with students, they're more likely to see, oh, this could be a civic mentor. We're all keen on academic mentors. We're all keen on professional mentors. And what she's arguing is there's a role for being a civic mentor as we communicate with students about how we are our own engagement in the community or our own action on a nonprofit board or our own work on a political campaign. So that, I think, is an interesting role. So we do have a CMG scale. I won't go into all the information about that. I've given you lots of information um, if you want, want that. And this is on our website. and. Uh, others, um, uh, we were able to present on this at Campus Compact last week, and others will contact us and say, do you care if we use the term civic-minded graduate? It's like, no, use it. <laughs> it's fine um, if, if it resonates. I don't, you know, it, it may not be a term that resonates in your context. Or the scale, we have a 30-item scale. Um, and it's asking specifically about my education at IUPUI. <coughs> People have tweaked that to say my experience on the class. You know, so you're asking people about that experience on the class. We also have a civic-minded graduate um, narrative and a rubric to evaluate that. And so with our uh, students who are involved in like alternative break trips or our Sam Jones scholars, we would have them complete the civic-minded graduate scale and also the narrative in order to understand how they are seeing themselves um, um, after this experience. And so uh, that's been interesting work. So we've had four different research studies. Um, and um, again, I don't, I don't think the purpose necessarily is to have to go into that, but it is a tool that is there in case you are interested in looking at that or tweaking it or using it in some particular way. We do know that the number of service learning classes in all four studies has contributed to growth in civic mindedness through um, on using this particular measure. And that this measure correlates with other measures of pro-social behavior 
as well as different um, sense of, uh, Morton says it's students prefer three different kinds of service and it correlates with all different kinds. So, um, so the question becomes to what it, so what about CMG? So what if we have this scale? Why does that matter? So what if we have the construct? Why does that matter? And so this is just to illustrate a bit that this has mattered a lot, I'd say, on our own internal work in the Center for Service and Learning. But it's also had now a ripple effect across campus. So that if you go to our campus strategic plan, our campus strategic plan now says uh, IUPUI will, is you know, developing civic-minded graduates. The language has gotten now up the, up the food chain in a very good way. <laughs> to be able to say that's the purpose of IUPUI's education, is to develop civic-minded graduates. And so um, it's changed we, in our work with academic units. Um, we, we work with uh, people on program and course design and evaluation, but academic units on um, dentistry, for example, um, um, uh, somebody in uh, rehabilitation and health sciences, I'm trying to think, oh, um, English as a second language. So different, different uh, folks on campus where we're now saying, and by, again, this is not required at IUPUI in the, in, at, at all. It's primarily our program. But then if a faculty member comes and says, I want to know how I can evaluate the civic outcomes, then we're able to at least point them in this particular direction. Um, and we, we do it for service learning courses and course design um, and faculty development workshops. So on to now the supporting faculty, and I'll finish my comments in about five minutes here. So supporting faculty is key and essential. You can't advance service learning by 10% if faculty are not gain, giving additional support and resources. Um, lots of different ways to do this. Um, these are some of the different ways that we have uh, taken on at IUPUI. We have learned, I will say this, oops, the, I will say this one right here has been surprisingly very valuable to us. And um, particularly if you take a group of faculty to a conference, that seems to be very beneficial. But there's three programs I want to make mention of um, that I think if, I, if we're trying to tip that number or increase that number significantly by 10% or in again back in our case where we tried to double the number of service learning classes I started thinking what did we do so we did three particular things one is around scholarships one's around working with faculty and faculty learning communities and then one was the engaged department strategy so I'll talk a little about each of those our campus made a hugely strategic decision in about, 19, well, started in about 1996. I got a call in 1994. The campus had funding from license plates. In Indiana, you can have, um, I don't know, in Kentucky, can you have, yeah, okay, so you can have your university license plate, all right? We get a call in 1994, soon after we'd sort of hung out the shingle, and they said, we have, uh, campus scholarship dollars, student government is saying that these scholarship dollars should go to a student who's been involved in service, either on campus or in the community. Would you all like to take this on? And we said yes. So we started with three, at that time what was called License to Learn Community Service Scholars. Next year we had three more. Next year we got a kickback from Visa because of the charge card. And, you know, use for tuition, we got a kickback, and it bumped up to seven community service scholars, and we thought we were something. Mm -hmm. Then, two major decisions happened. Bill Plater said, no, if IUPUI cares about civic engagement, we need to attract students to come to campus. Just like we would, we would need to start considering merit as a service as a form of merit. Just like we would give a scholarship to someone who's really strong in academics, we'd give 
scholarships to someone who's really talented in athletics, we are going to start earmarking a certain part of our scholarship dollars to recognize students who are coming into the campus with a commitment to service and a desire to stay engaged over time. So suddenly we now had $100,000, okay? Then through internal funding, that is now at about 600,000 annually, which is the engine that runs what we do. And so again, I was at the Center on Philanthropy for two years starting that undergraduate program, and when I came back to apply for the executive director role, I start really looking at what is, what's ticking here? And I realize IEPUI is only, from, rec from a recognition perspective, I'll say that, is only because of our service-based scholarship programs. Because that's what gives you as faculty an extra set of hands. That's one of them. So we have different kinds of scholarship programs. Um, eight different kinds, it's all on our website if you're curious about that. Of that 600,000, about 240,000 annually is given to a faculty member. So that um, Jen Shaker will apply to us and she'll say, I would like a service learning assistant to help in P105 so that students are engaged in the community as a part of this introductory course. Can I have a service learning assistant? Yes, you may. You know, and so they go through this application process, and it is to assist faculty, staff, or departmental initiatives across teaching, research, or service. So now we have a portion of this funding that's designated for community-engaged research. So I am... Um, I am wanting, I'm in the business school and I want to do an economic impact study and analysis of this particular neighborhood and the outcomes or da 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 da. I can apply to, for, so the name service learning assistant isn't probably the best name. It's more than service learning. It's any engaged work that I want to do. And so um, this has been um, phenomenally important. And I think what it is, it's an internal reallocation of funds. Every campus has a certain amount of scholarship dollars. Um, and, and can it be tweaked in such a way? And I'd suggest start small. You know, can you get 20,000? You can do a lot with $20,000 of scholarship money. Or, or get, just give us a little bit. Let us show you what we can do with a service-based scholarship program. Another strategy is the faculty learning community. We started this with Boyer, and we're using it in another way now, but the idea behind this was to call, bring together faculty who wanted to do scholarship on their service learning course. So Ernest Boyer is, talks about the scholarship of engagement, and so these were called Boyer Scholars, and I led this program for about five years. I will point out this little bit right here. We started, we had ca more cash at the point. We started here, and now I advise campuses that you don't even need a stipend to do this kind of program. I do think what you need is, campus, is conference dollars, travel dollars. Those are highly important to our faculty. So I don't, think, I don't think that this is accurate. I just wanted to say that's how we started, but that's not what kept people at the table. What it is, is it keeps people at the table who come and they are meeting with six other faculty from different disciplines. And I tell you what keeps people at the table is coffee. <laughs> and it's true. And so it's having coffee, it's having this structured um, uh, um, curriculum that you're going through, and um, you're working with faculty and, and you're asking faculty to um, do readings, complete scholarly products, have a timeline, and then the huge outcome of this, it is change in classes. We started it as a scholarship thing, but it's change in classes, but more importantly, it's created campus leaders. So if I look across our campus, it's the former Boyer scholars who now are leading the work out of dentistry, who are leading it out of physical education and tourism management, 
who's leading it out of museum studies, because what it is is it gives faculty um, much more of a very solid footing around the literature in service learning. So a lot of, a lot of campuses do this model in order around how to teach a service learning class. But I highly advise that you would do it on how do you do scholarship on your service learning class. Can you write an article? Can you write a blog? Can you do a presentation? What is that? Because if you get faculty as scholars around the work, that's automatically going to change the course um, anyway. And I, I mean, and that fits again with one of your goals of your campus is to increase that scholarship work that faculty and the production that you have. So this has been very important. Now, right now, this is um, a faculty learning community on public scholarships. So right now, we're using the same approach. And again, it's you'll see of this, um, there's seven faculty in this group now. And um, this is a three-year initiative between our Center for Service and Learning and, oops, and Faculty Affairs. And so the idea behind this, and you'll see we're using a design thinking strategy here, and um, we, we meet on a monthly basis, and we are doing a concept paper on public scholarship in order to get that into promotion and tenure guidelines. And so we, I will toot their horn, <laughs> we actually have the words public scholarship in the campus guidelines, and we're able to include the definition now going forward. And then next year's faculty learning community will be doing uh, the criteria and what the, the actual criteria are. But my point to this is when you bring faculty together across disciplines and you have a certain program that they're about doing, it builds a whole lot of collegiality and a whole lot of um, um, confidence, I'd say. And then you're not the only one trying to advance this cause because other people are right alongside. Um, and then a couple of you were able to, so Kelly and then um, I think were you, you were at the Research Academy, is that, because yeah. I recognize your face, I, and yeah. your name again? Robin. Robin, okay. I don't know if you, if we, you, the Boy Your Scholars then is what worked into the approach at the faculty, uh, at the Research Academy, and I don't know if you want to say anything about that experience or... I know it's been a couple of years yes. um, since we were there, and I wasn't teaching at that time. I was working with the Office for Service Learning here on campus. Okay. So with the shift of roles, I, I know I'm just at a loss at the moment. I apologize. No, no worries. Yeah. So what we do there is we ask people to come in with a question, and then we break you up into a group um, to, be, to meet with eight other people over the two and a half day period. And so this is just uh, people at the Research Academy. Then the third thing I'd suggest is um, the strategy of the engaged department grants. And this is something that we did early on. We don't do it now because every faculty development program, you know, sort of um, has its, it, you can almost only do one thing for about three or four years and then it sort of fizzles or something. But this idea is shifting the focus from a course to the curriculum. So rather than a course development grant where you're working on your individual course and I'm working on mine, uh, an engaged department grant is putting three or four people from your department around your curriculum and saying, let's map out across our curriculum what we're doing around and it might be all of these different ERA experiences. You know, it could be all of those or it could be across service learning or it could be across civic outcome, service learning and civic outcomes. And so the idea is that you're trying to scaffold these experiences in the curriculum. And so Kevin Kefkes has written a lot about engaged department initiatives. National Campus Compact has an entire booklet, you know, um, a, a strategy um, to do uh, engaged departments. And again, it takes like, you know, probably two and a half days on the front end, a day in August, you know, a day in August, and then checking in with the departments. And again, the people that we invested in over those engaged department initiatives then become the champions on campus. 
And I'm thinking that if your goal is to increase it by 10%, you want to have a collective approach to that 10% in a department, not just trying to get one-off faculty, because also one-off faculty end up leaving. <laughs> and one-offs end up not having that institutional change factor um, in, terms of, in terms of the curriculum. So here's where our, you know, we've got that's the CMG tools, um, uh, some publications, and then some, um, I wanted, we hadn't had this list before, and I think it is also important. Where can you publish? Um, so publication outlets, I, we have that as new um, information. And then there's lots of different professional associations, so that if you're wondering, well, if I did something on my course, where could I present it? You know, where, where would I actually get credit for uh, sharing this information? And so those publications and um, outlets are, I think, very important. So. And then that's information on our, on our um, research academy. If that's of interest, we have, we partner with Indiana Campus Compact. The first two and a half days are for service learning course design. Many of you probably already know all about that, so you don't. You, maybe that's not your interest, or if you're new and you're and you're curious about, well, how could I really improve my class? Um, Indiana Campus Compact offers that Service Learning Institute from Monday until Wednesday at noon, and then our center comes in, um, and, and we work with you then around. Uh, a re I'll say a research question. It's really not solely research, it's really a scholarly question. So sometimes people come to this um, who are more focused on faculty development rather than what I'd say uh, is research on service learning most generally. So. so I wish you the very best in your goals of getting up, you know, increasing service learning by 10%. Uh, I hope it has given you a few ideas and be glad to answer any questions, but I also know that you probably are wondering if your sump pump is working. Or, <laughs> you know, there's some basic, like, you know, on the pyramid, we're pretty at the low level. You know, what is it, the hierarchy of needs? You may have, uh, the fact that you've stayed put this long is actually quite impressive, so. Um, I do have a question about, sure. going back to the scholarships. Sure. I'm a little confused as to whether or not those were student scholarships or faculty scholarships. Yes, good question. Or were we talking about both? Both, yeah, okay. good, yeah. Student. So, so the um, eight different scholarships are student scholarships? Let's see, so, good question. Um, all the scholarships go to students, okay? Um, so $600,000 <coughs> is going to students. Oh. Is that an endowment or is that? No, campus so somebody just put that in somebody's budget? So <laughs> you're gonna have, you're gonna have, I'm guessing, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you have scholarship money at the institutional level to attract merit and athletes to Murray State. So it's a decision that happened at that level of campus funds and so we have eight different types of programs. We have freshman service scholars, community service scholars, community service leaders, service corps, Fugate scholars, community partner scholars, and I'm forgetting a couple, okay? Mm -hmm. Those are all student-run scholarships. Now it takes a whole, it takes staff to run all these programs, and by the way, we always call it a program. It's not just a scholarship because we have expectations built into the scholarship that students are active, so it's a program. So that could be incoming freshmen all the way through seniors? I mean, so incoming freshmen, we give 15 freshman service scholars. Now, IUPUI, I saw your retention numbers, IUPUI and graduation rate, we have very similar numbers on retention and graduation rate. So we don't typically, we have students that are coming and going, you know. So our scholarship program is not like Bonner, if you're familiar with that. Bonner is 
all four years, that's not our. That's not how ours are run. So it's year um, to year. Then. I'm sorry. Year to year. Year, year to year. Mm -hmm. okay. So. So of these eight, there's eight different kinds that go directly to the student themselves. I'm glad you asked the question. Of that 600,000, though, 240 goes to a faculty member, and as I use the illustration of Jen Shaker. So Jen applies, and, she's, and when she gets the answer, yes, you may have a service learning scholar to help you in P105. Then it's up to Jen to identify who that scholar is. She's she says, oh, I know who I want, and I want it to be Sarah. So I'm going to, so Sarah then gets the scholarship. But Jen applies for it. Jen applies for it. The faculty member applies for it. And then as the responsibility, I'm a, as a faculty member, I have to identify the student as well. Oftentimes, it's somebody who was in your service learning course who was a high-achieving student. And so then you tell us, do you want a service scholar for five hours a week, or do you want them for 10 hours a week, depending on the scope of engagement that you have? And so then it's up to you to identify and find them. And then we've done different things. We do an orientation. We do a brown bag lunch. We don't do a lot with the students. They get shirts. They get Sam H. Jones Scholars shirts. So we order a lot of shirts. So, so I meant to say, we started with three in 1994, and now last year, 214 service scholars. And the other thing about that program is that service scholars, the retention rate and the graduation completion rate, particularly for Pell-eligible students, is higher than the campus average for Pell-eligible students. And, and then it's, it's higher than the average for all students. But particularly, we're finding that these are scholarships that are really important for students that are coming who are Pell eligible. And so you get them involved in such a way that, and you, you know what happens with involvement. It gives them additional social ties. And um, so, yeah, thanks for your well, question. Thank you for explaining that. that yeah. That's really a different, unique model that I have, I have not heard of. No, well, when I, again, when I came back to CSL, I thought, this is our engine. And it's the first thing I say to campuses when I consult now, because I just think it's in, it's in your power to do this. <laughs> well, I know we've it's in a decision, somebody's right. decision, right. if and service would become a source of merit. Right. And see, we, the university, as we exist now, we do, to my knowledge, do not have anything in the tenure system that pushes faculty to do service. Right. So that's been a challenge. Plus, we, I think, attempted maybe to put some seed dollars out there for faculty, but without the student engagement, it's hard for the faculty to do anything with a couple of thousand dollars. Yep. So that's a different model that really, I think, And fits. oftentimes, oftentimes people will hold up, it's not in promotion and tenure guidelines. Therefore, we can't make any progress. And that is not true. <laughs> I say that because I've worked on a campus this whole time where it's not clear in our campus promotion and tenure guidelines. So we have this mission for community engagement, but we've never had an alignment. So Carnegie, our feedback from Carnegie this year, you have a misalignment between your mission and your promotion and tenure guidelines. I think it's important, but I don't think it's what's the critical thing. I think it's having... You know, we go back to those motives. There's a lot of faculty who actually might be willing to care in this direction if they had an extra set of hands to help them. Or another thing also, again, your campus might be different, but our faculty, it's interesting, and I didn't know this, I didn't think of this early on, it's considered an internal grant. So when a faculty member, you know, has their annual report, and they can put down. I've, I had a service learning assistant, and you start, you see that now on faculty annual reports, like, I, and I got funding from the Center for Service and Learning to go to AAC and U and present. You know, these are small things, but then I would also argue that this, to what end? Why would we be doing this? It's actually for student learning. 
because students are having very meaningful experiences when they're in the leadership position or when they're working with their civic mentor. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty good win-win in my and, and opinion. I'll, I will share that when we attempted Carnegie, which was over eight, nine, maybe years ago, <laughs> so it's been a long time and it was way before we had the QEP and the now strategic plan that we are working off of, but that was some of the feedback that we heard was misalignment um, with our promotion and tenure, no real way to um, track and identify the students' uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the assessment piece and the institutional tracking was, was very visible at that point. We just couldn't, we knew it was happening, we just couldn't pull the pieces yeah, together right. from the yeah. various departments and units. Yeah. And and it is a process, so I would say now that we have our QEP, that could kind of become the task force group that could push the Carnegie down the road, I think, yeah. within a couple of years. So if, if you even want to do it. You right. know? And, and I'm not <laughs> because, sure that we're getting any I mean, push from the, value, the top down. The value of doing it is that it's a reason to get people around the table. That's more important than the actual seal. Exactly. <laughs> it's like when you start to get people around the table and they start, you know, and that's why I think John Saltmarsh is saying, keep the, keep your task force working, even after you get the seal. The seal, it's like a seal of approval that you sort of go, really, I mean, now some people do a lot with it. Our campus hasn't been very good from a PR perspective of doing much with the seal. Sometimes you see it on websites, but. And we have, we have received the presidential honor yeah, that's great. Row, so. That's super. And that's, that's a, a seal. Start. Exactly. No, it's very good. Any other questions? Let's get on home. <laughs>